Welcome to today's event at the Swindon Festival of Literature, or rather this year's virtual online Swindon Festival of Literature. Many thanks for joining us, and we do hope that everything is fine where you are. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on. Well, at least to go on online. Today's guest author, a doctor by profession, believes in the power of human stories to build empathy and inspire change. She has written a beautiful book, a moving book, an informative book, and a timely book, and it's beautifully titled as well, Dear Life, A Doctor's Story of Love and Loss. Just reading the prologue had me eagerly marking passages and saying, yes, 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 terrific. Today's guest interviewer works in the field and shares similar concerns to that of our author. Please join me now in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature welcome to guest interviewer, Dr. Natasha Wiggins, and our guest author, Dr. Rachel Clark. Welcome, both of you. Thanks very much, Matt. It's really lovely to be here. Hi, um, hi Matt, and thank you again uh, from me. It's lovely to be here. No, well, it's terrific, and we're going to have a good chat about the book. Um, but just before that, um, it's a shame you can't both he be here live. You're far away. Um, and Swindon in spring is lovely. Not quite like Paris, but it's lovely nonetheless. Have either of you ever been to Swindon? Um, well, I actually work just down the road um, in our lovely Great Western Hospital. And so I, uh, I treat myself to a view of Swindon on a daily basis. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I have very a deep rooted connection with Swindon because when I was a little girl, the absolute highlight of the year on my birthday or my brothers and sisters birthdays was to go on a trip to Swindon Oasis that had not only slides, but a wave machine. And that was the pinnacle of excitement of the whole year. So I, I love Swindon from an early age. <laughs> oh. That's terrific, Rachel. And I won't bring you the sad news that the Oasis may be closing down, but that's another story. No. Um, <laughs> um, let's get back to the topic in hand, your beautiful book, Dear Life, which has been described as both a love letter and a testament to the vital important, importance of human connection at times of crisis. And have we had times of crisis lately? Um, Rachel, Natasha, tell us more, please. Um, well, thank you, Matt. Um, so, Rachel, I mean, it's it's a while ago now that your your book came out, um, but I'd like you to, I guess, cast your mind back. And what was it? What was it that made you want to write this book? It's quite a a raw thing to do. It's quite a you make yourself quite vulnerable in the book. Well, I I think. Um... Two, two things really inspired it. I had just started specialising as a palliative care doctor and, and almost at exactly the same time, my own father, who was himself a retired uh, doctor and also uh, someone I had had on a pedestal since the age of two, pretty much, was himself diagnosed with terminal cancer and so my first year of learning my specialty and how to be a good palliative care doctor coincided with um, a, really a year of cancer just stealthily bit by bit claiming pieces of my father and ultimately as we knew it would from the outset, um, it was a terminal diagnosis when he was diagnosed claiming his life. And so I found myself simultaneously learning everything about caring for patients and their families at the end of life, which I, I was desperately excited to do, but also living through the personal experience of um, grieving, almost having an anticipatory grief for the loss to come of someone I loved so so desperately dearly. And I realised that everything I had learned as a doctor, all my experience, didn't have that. 
And I thought it was valuable to try and write as a doctor about why and explore this um, often taboo subject of death and dying and grief and loss, because whether we like it or not, it is going to affect us all. It's the one thing that's guaranteed. We are mortal. And I wanted to try and tackle it because I hoped it would be positive and valuable maybe to have a kind of public conversation about it. And do you feel that's happened? Do you feel that since the book's come out that people have, you know, come up to you or contacted you talking about death and dying? Yeah, very much so. Um, and so, so the book came out, um, ironically, perhaps about two months before Britain was plunged into day one of lockdown. Who would have anticipated that the year 2020 would become the year of death and dying, which it most definitely has. And, and, and one of my main motivations for writing the book was to tackle the fear and denial and taboo around this topic of death, very understandably. Um, and it, all of a sudden, death was everywhere. It was the front page headline of every newspaper day after day we had last year, you know, we were hearing about the latest number of people who had died from coronavirus. Um, but in those first couple of months be before we turned into um, a, a, a country and during a pandemic, I, I did lots of talks. We were still able to actually interact with each other then. And, um, and I wrote a lot about the book. It was, it was in the media a little bit. And the incredible thing about that was any every talk I did, people would, would come up afterwards sharing their own stories of grief, of loss, mm -hmm. or perhaps saying, I have a terminal cancer myself, I have a stage four cancer, and hearing you talk about this is helpful. And I started getting letters and messages on social media, emails from literally hundreds of people. And it felt as though, in a very small way, the book had kind of split open this taboo subject and it clearly struck a chord with people because so many people started sharing their stories with me and I found that incredibly hopeful and powerful because in palliative medicine we're used to people sort of blinking and feeling very awkward when you say that you work in a hospice and maybe flinching a little bit and thinking gosh that must be the most depressing job in the world why, why would a doctor do that whereas actually and I suspect it's the same for you, Natasha, as it is for me. I, I love going to work every day. I find it inspiring and such a positive, wonderful thing to do. Um, and it really felt as though writing the book had opened up in a, in a little bit this conversation and who knows, maybe dispelled a bit of fear and taboo along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, you've touched on a couple of things there I'd, I'd love to talk more about. I mean, I think the first thing is this sort of the combination of, of your book and then, you know, death being a, a daily headline, which is something that as a nation we're just so unfamiliar with. Um, you know, and, and I think we can't we can't have this conversation without talking about COVID and, you know, what's been going on in the last 12 months. And, and you know, you and I are offensively optimistic. And I think... And I think we can agree that, you know, maybe a, a glimmer of positivity that's come from COVID is almost this, this reconnection with, with mortality, um, which is certainly, you know, like you say, it was a crack that you, you opened up in your first book. Um, and I wonder if there's, if there's something that you think that you, you think's changed as a result of that. Yes, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I I, I think that um, for me, I I felt very early on in in the pandemic last year as though um, almost on a on a national stage, we were seeing people collectively go through the same kinds of experience that we might see individually with our patients and their families in a hospice. Mm. So, so very often, if, if someone is given a, a, a terminal diagnosis, initially it feels cataclysmic, shattering your whole sense of yourself as a person with a future that just 
goes on into the misty distance is shattered. All you can think about is the fact that it's over, you are going to die. And we often encounter patients who are just reeling from that or their families are reeling from it. And um, it's really common initially um, to not only be shattered and traumatized by that kind of diagnosis, but also feel very depressed, feel as though ha there's nothing to enjoy anymore. There's, there's no way of finding beauty or meaning in your life because you know your days are numbered. And, um, and one of the things that I think I, I try to do very proactively when I meet a patient for the first time is explore a little bit of that. Often they will come to a hospice are absolutely convinced that if you set foot inside a hospice, you will definitely never leave again. And they may be astonished to find out that it, it is not the case at all that everybody who is admitted to a hospice dies. Many patients will come in because they have symptoms that they're struggling with and we'll help them with those symptoms, sort out their pain, and then they'll go home and we may not see them again for six months. And that often is already a, a source of hope and comfort for patients. But maybe more fundamentally, even if someone is coming into a hospice and that is an end of life admission, they will die under our care. Our attitude is very much um, a terminal diagnosis in a really profound sense. It might feel as though it changes everything, but it doesn't actually change anything in a profound sense because we are all mortal our days are numbered we we might choose not to think of it but we are all going to die and that means every single day of life we have is precious and if you you have a small number of days left then arguably they're even more precious so our jobs as palliative care doctors are all about helping patients find meaning and joy and a little bit of life's beauty and wonder in whatever time they have. And that might be the simplest thing of opening a window and hearing the bird song or letting the spring sunshine sort of shine onto somebody's face. And even if you're too weak to lift your head from a pillow, you can still savor that sunshine. So all of that is going on in, at an individual level in a hospice. And then suddenly, I think this time a year ago in the pandemic, the whole country was confronted with the fragility of human life. Not only these awful daily death tolls, but the idea that anyone could catch a virus, a fatal virus. It could, it was invisible, it was everywhere. It could pick on you, 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 and you, and no one was safe. It did affect young people as well as old people, even children very occasionally. And so as a society, we were all having to confront that, that your days could be numbered. And of course, tragically, for over 150,000 families, a, a loved one did lose their life to COVID and that number will continue to go up. So we've almost collectively, I think, as a country, taken a step inside the threshold of a hospice almost whether we like it or not we've been forced to think about mm. how very fragile human life is mm. yeah i i agree and i i i love the the examples that you gave about finding beauty in in what we may have previously taken taken for granted um, you know the uh, and I think what what I really feel is pervasive throughout dear life um, from the picture on the front cover um, to a thread running through is the concept of nature and and coming back and you and you 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 talk about it in the book and you talk about it so beautifully about how people really relish the very simple things of nature um, is that something that you you found comforting when you were coping with your father's illness? So much so, and, and he did as well. Um, so he, what one of the things that I found remarkable about my father's illness was his astonishing capacity to still savour life, despite knowing that there was a cancer in his body and he couldn't eradicate it. He was going to live with it until the day he died. Um, 
I think probably all of us before we're diagnosed with 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 a, a life limiting disease might imagine that we would never recover from the shock of that diagnosis, you would, you would be terrified, you would be depressed and so on. And my dad was um, the kind of doctor who basically didn't really like needles, he, he, he didn't particularly want to ever have a blood test or anything. So I thought for him, especially the, the ordeal of chemotherapy and all, all the traumatic treatments that are often associated with cancer, I, I, I thought it would be devastating for him. And in fact, he, of course, it was profound, but he, he just had this ability to, to adapt to it, a resilience, and to still savour every single one of the things that he had done before he knew a cancer was going to claim his life. The only meaningful change was he, his chemotherapy stopped him enjoying the taste of wine, so he reverted to beer, which was his drink of youth. And I thought there was something very beautiful about that. He returned to drinking the occasional pint rather than a nice expensive you know, bottle of claret. Um, but nature was the thing that he'd loved all through his life. And for as long as he was able, he would every day, rain or shine, get out for a walk over the fields. And even a few days, it was less than a week before he died. I remember this bitterly, bitterly cold winter's day. And we went out and he put on all his old walking gear against the biting wind and his walking sticks to support him because he was so frail. He was almost like a skeleton. And we went out into this biting wind and he was only able to walk not even a hundred yards, a few yards down, down the pavement. And he looked at a, an old magnolia tree which fl flowers beautifully every, every year in the village where he lived. And um, and he looked at this magnolia tree, and and talk, we talked a little bit about how beautiful it is every spring, and and how gorgeous he found that. And then he noticed something about it, and he said it was completely bare. It was the middle of winter, and he said, he said it's very old that tree. I think it's reached the end of its life. And it was this beautiful moment where his life cycle, he was rooting it in nature's cycles which of course begin with life and end in death and yet don't because anything that ends up as mulch in the soil provides sustenance for new generations of life and I think he found a real sense of comfort in being rooted in those those circles and cycles of life and being a part of the natural order of things. Mm. Gosh, Rachel, that's a really um, incredible image. And it's something that's very comforting as well to, to hold on to. Um, I think um, certainly in the last year, people have been seeking comfort. You know, we've, <laughs> we've all talked about, you know, everyone manically baking bread. There's something comforting in cultivating carbohydrates um, that I think we never really knew about before. Um, and I think it's, I guess we can't really uh, just talk about dear life um, this in this chat, because since then, um, you've incredibly, despite swimming in the sea of COVID for the last year, you, you've written another book, um, which is called Breathtaking. Uh, and it's about sort of the experience the first wave of the pandemic sort of from deep in the heart the beating heart of, of the NHS um I've read it and Rach I I mean I must say it's it's an incredible stomp through that first wave um and I just I wondered if you could talk to me a little bit about the, your your experience of writing that book yes uh it 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 was a very, um, I think, I think ev probably everybody in Britain has experienced something traumatic in the last year. I mean, if there's one thing that unites us, it's just confronting not only the virus itself, the, the, the horrible scale of the loss of life, but just every conceivable aspect of, of normality, normal life and living being upturned by this pandemic. And I, I, and I certainly 
um, have found the last year traumatic that the, the first wave in particular, when if you think back a year ago, we had no vaccines, no treatments. Uh, we were, I, I was desperate to be working in the hospital with COVID patients. Um, I think all of us in palliative care knew that our skills would be very important, um, clearly in a pandemic, and, and, and I was desperate to be caring for those patients most in need. But of course, in the context of no treatments, no vaccines, we, we also knew that going the act of going to work was potentially risky. You could catch COVID yourself, you could bring it back home to your families. And it was stunningly traumatic to suddenly find yourself on COVID wards where the, the, the numbers of patients with the disease, the numbers of people dying from the disease was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. It People used to use um, military language, lots of battle metaphors. And, and, and in general, I, I resist that kind of language in medicine. I, I'm not sure it's helpful to, to um, tell patients that they're battling a cancer. There are lots of issues around that. But, but actually, in this case, there were definite um, uh, similarities to battlefield medicine in the sense that in a war zone, you have to triage patients, you have to sort of focus your attentions on, on, on the number you can save because there aren't enough of you compared to the number of casualties. And likewise, at the peak of the first wave and particularly the second wave this January, we were overwhelmed with patients. There weren't enough of us. And it was deeply traumatic, sort of trying so hard to do your best, but being surrounded by this wave of dying. And I think this book, came out of that trauma really I, I when I'm stressed out I don't sleep I started writing at night partly because otherwise I would have just woken up my husband <laughs> who was lying next to me as I lay there sort of tensely unable to sleep and I used to just bash away on my laptop in the kitchen and then gradually last summer as the initial wave of trauma subsided, I realized that I actually wanted to write about this and put it into the public domain because it seemed so important for the testimony of, of, of those of us inside the NHS to be out there because the doors of our hospitals were closed. Nobody knew what was happening inside. Um, the cameras were not allowed in for much of the pandemic and I, I wanted to document it and, and, and partly I wanted to do that because despite all of the death and dying, there was something truly remarkable and extraordinary about the experience of the last year as a doctor. And that was the sheer daily amount of courage, selflessness, strength, humility, kindness, compassion, all of those wonderful human qualities were there in the most incredible way every single day at work. And I would look at my colleagues, the nurses, the healthcare assistants, the porters, everybody traumatized, everybody carrying on doing their absolute best for patients and the patients and families themselves who were so brave and just sometimes would almost seem to care, worry more about you than themselves. You mustn't get COVID, don't get COVID yourself. And I felt as though I was just part of this outpouring of the very best things about human nature day after day at work. And I wanted to tell that story because the horror of the pandemic is real, but that aspect of the pandemic is real too. And I wanted to tell that story. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. I actually, you know, despite being in the midst of some really, really traumatic situations, I actually found the most things overwhelming were the kindness, kindnesses of strangers towards me and my colleagues. Um, and those were the moments when I thought, oh, gosh, this is really, this is really overwhelming now. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting that you, that you're talking about humanity and human nature, because when I was reading Breathtaking, one of the things that struck me was uh, a, a distinct lack of what makes us human, that that had been taken away. 
um, by COVID. You know, you talk about, you know, without visitors in ICU, it just feels like a lab treating numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the way that we were all trussed up in our PPE, so we were just these eyes, um, not able to convey the warmth that we were trying so desperately to. And and I, it really made me think about what is it that makes us human? You know, what it, what is humanity? And I, I never really, I never really found an answer. I don't know if you've, if you've got one. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I mean, lot, lots of NHS staff have talked about the, the most traumatic thing about this pandemic being not actually the, 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 the scale of the death and dying per se, although of course that has been traumatic, but exactly what you describe and what I, I've written about in the book, um, the ways in which COVID separates us from each other at exactly those times when we need human contact the most, whether it is through the physical barriers of PPE um, or the lack of visiting and most hospitals have only allowed visitors for patients if they are judged to be imminently dying and sometimes you get it wrong so a patient may die without their family at the bedside. All of that seems to uh, attack something that is so deep and primal and instinctive in us and I think I certainly found myself just tortured by having to pick up a telephone and and speak to you know a, a woman who had been married to her husband for 60 years he was now dying of COVID in the hospital and I was having to communicate shouting almost over my mask and my PPE to a lady who was sitting by herself at home herself maybe shielding so unable to come into the hospital and having to explain that her husband was dying under those circumstances was just so wrong, it made my skin crawl. It was just awful. And um, teams who, when you hold up an an iPad or or a phone to a family so that they can see the person they love, who they are losing, but they can't be there physically, just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, what this has taught me about humanity is something that, I think it's easy to forget much of the time and I think modern society almost encourages us to forget it and it's this it's that yes we're very clever rational creatures but actually we are creatures we are flesh and blood we are warm blooded mammals and our physicality our tactility with each other and all the ways we interact with the world is a really profound and important part of being human. And usually we only really savor or or focus on tactility for kind of reasons of central pleasure, whether it is um, drinking a nice glass of wine or feeling sunshine on the beach or having sex. You know, there are all these incredible central ways in which we, we, we relish and sort of revel in our tactility but actually, tactility is a, is a profound part of how we communicate with each other. There's the concept of skin hunger, <clears throat> the concept of neuroscience that refers to this sort of terrible aching void we feel if we can't touch each other. And we're, you, people listening will probably remember um, quite a long time ago now in the 1990s, awful stories of children, babies in Romanian orphanages who had been literally left in a cot and not touched for for months on end. And they ended up actually brain damaged some of these children because they had received no physical contact from, from carers at all. And I just think I think if if there's a simple but profound lesson to come from this pandemic, it's it's to recognize that we human beings, we're just animals with not not much fur on our skin. You know, we need maybe not to groom each other. I'm not suggesting picking insects out of each other's fur, but we need to touch, we need to hold hands, to embrace, to kiss, to cuddle, to cherish each other physically. 
And coronavirus has just run roughshod through all of that with shattering effects because mm. this is primal, this is part of who we are. Mm. That's really interesting. And it's, it's sort of got me thinking about the concept of connectivity as well. So making a connection. And sometimes that connection is just, you know, a, a touch in the right place, you know, just a hand on someone's arm just when they need it. Um, and so certainly when we have those really difficult conversations, just making that contact at the right moment can, uh, and I think it's something you talk about in, in Dear Life as well. It's about, you know, the choosing, the, the art of picking the right words at the right time um, to have these really difficult, delicate conversations. Um, and, that, and they are um, enhanced and facilitated by, you know, just judging it right when you touch someone, when you take that touch away. Um, you know, you know, allowing them to know that you're there, but that they're that they also you're not invading their space. And I think it's really, really difficult when you're having those difficult conversations that you don't have that connectivity. Um, and I, I just, and I, and I re recall earlier you were talking about about sort of making really difficult decisions. You know, things that we've never really things that in the past would have sort of felt inconceivable, not just decisions about, you know, rationalizing care, which is something that feels deeply uncomfortable, but also decisions about your own health and, you know, having to decide, do I, do I go to work and put my family at risk? Mm. You know, and, and how do people reconcile those decisions? Mm. Absolutely. And, um, the, I, I think this touches on um, something which I I really wanted to explore in Dear Life, um, but all, again, it re-explored in Breathtaking be, because it seems to me to be so important, the, um, the, the, the issue of thinking ahead in advance about what if the worst happens and your life is threatened or you're severely... Um, injured or disabled for, by, through illness, how would you like your care to be? How would you like the end of your life to be? And somehow I think COVID has raised the stakes around that so profoundly because um, the decision, for example, whether or not to stay at home if you're life-threateningly unwell with COVID or to go into hospital, actually suddenly is a difference is a decision around essentially do you want to still see your family and be with your family or do you want to go into hospital and perhaps have a tiny chance of your life being saved but at the risk of if your life can't be saved dying without your family and the people you love around you and um, so the stakes have been unbelievably high this year because of all the infection control measures, including visit restrictions. And I suppose as um, an offensive optimist, I do look for the things that are positive and could bring about meaningful change for the better um, always. And in a catastrophe, there are many of those things, the Second World War, you know, we end we, penicillin, antibiotics, all these important things. Um, and I think this topic of advanced care planning has really come to the fore during the pandemic and it's so important. So, so advanced care planning is the, the just the simple idea of thinking ahead to how you might like things to be at the end of your life. Would you like to have intensive care, go on a ventilator, have CPR, resuscitation, or actually might you prefer not to have those very um, aggressive medical interventions? Might you actually prefer something more peaceful? Might you wish to be at home with your family? And um, the worst circumstances in which to have those kinds of discussions with, with doctors and medical teams is in the middle of a crisis when, you know, your mum is rushed into hospital and a doctor turns to you and says, do you have any idea what Mrs. Jones may have wanted at the end of her life? Do you think she would have wanted to go to intensive care, for instance? And we've probably been in this situation a thousand times where 
the family will look at you aghast and say and realize they have no idea because they've never had that conversation and it can make it very traumatic for everybody so all the way through the pandemic I, i've been trying to encourage people to just have a chat about that it's not a big momentous conversation you know make a cup of tea sit with your family and have a chat i for instance know that if i was uh, severely brain damaged, I wouldn't want to go on a ventilator, I wouldn't want to go to intensive care, I would rather let nature take its course. And I've told my family, even my kids know that, which, um, mm -hmm. you know, that may, and actually, even they weren't traumatized by the conversation, they found it very interesting. And we had a long discussion. So, so maybe something that is positive and good to come out of the pandemic is, is a, um, a, 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 a willingness collectively together with our families as a society to talk about the end of our lives because if we do that that gives us the best chance of being the author of the end of our lives we have the chance to control how it might be and mm. isn't that magnificent if we can help everybody end their lives as close as possibly approximating to the way we would like it to be, not the way some doctor wants it on your behalf. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, when, when I think about the some of the deaths that you describe in Dear Life, um, and indeed the incredible gestures um, of people, both NHS and frontline workers, the key workers, and, you know, the loved ones of patients, I, I just feel a lot of hope. I feel that no matter how dark the tunnel is, there's always a glimmer of light somewhere. And, and I, th I feel like the, the thread running through both of your books is kind of hope. And I wondered, what is it during this, this really difficult year? What has given you hope? Well, hope is... Uh... I think hope is such an important um, quality, not just in medicine, but actually life in general. Ho hopelessness is almost perhaps the bleakest state and in severe depression, um, maybe even suicidal depression, one of the, the defining features of that state will be an absolute abject hopelessness, the feeling that there is nothing in the future that is good or positive or um, even slightly something to hope for. And at the same time, hope in medicine is risky. The one thing I think as doctors we must be at pains never to do is give people false hope. So false hope, wishful thinking, blind optimism, none of those are helpful um, and I think sometimes doctors are tempted to offer false optimism because the alternative is to have a really difficult painful conversation with a patient or their family and actually that's hard to do so it's tempting to leave that for someone else to do. Um, I, I believe always in medicine we must be honest um, and never try to sugarcoat reality and I think that hope is a con a belief that things might be better in the future there is the possibility no certainties no guarantees but at least the possibility that things could be better in the future but it's a conviction that has to be based in reality in fact and how the world is not how you want the world to be it it needs to be rooted in reality and for me, in the last year during this pandemic and working in a hospice in general, situations where, of course, there is a lot of grief and pain and darkness, I have great reason to feel hopeful, grounded in that, in that reality. And it's, that, it's, the, it's because of this, it's that even in the most catastrophic and darkest of circumstances, people are remarkable. It is staggering how pa patients' capacity to 
not just savor the time they have left, however short, but also to behave with such grace and dignity and sheer love towards their families, towards us, the, the team caring for them, to, towards the world that is slipping through their fingers and that they would give anything to cling on to, blows my mind on a daily basis. It is genuinely miraculous to me that I see that and, I, and I, I'm so grateful for working in a job where I see that. So my hope is grounded in human beings because in a hospice and in a pandemic, what I see on a daily basis is that fundamentally for all our flaws and failings and weaknesses and goodness knows we all have them, people are remarkable and decent and by and large good and that is the root of my hope. Thank you, Rachel. That was that's really beautiful, and I think that's certainly some uh, you know goodness of people is something that is in both dear life and breathtaking. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, did you have a, a little short paragraph, a little short excerpt from one of your books that you might want to read? I'd love to. Um, I, I've I've chosen um, a little extract from breathtaking, so um, about the pandemic. And I, I just wanted to read an extract, which is, um, this is right at the start of the pandemic when suddenly the whole country realized we were in crisis and people just wanted to help. And it, there was this outpouring of incredible action to help each other out. Um, and I'll, I'll, so I'll read a, a little passage about that. What proliferates in a pandemic, it turns out, takes human as well as viral form. Suddenly, small acts of kindness are rife. Yes, there are the frantic toilet roll hoarders who ransack supermarket shelves until their car boots are bulging. And yes, in London, briefly and incredibly, Junior doctors are actually mugged for their NHS ID badges so that some cheapskate assailant can purloin a free high street coffee intended for NHS staff. There will always be a few grifters, freeloaders, exploiters. But by and large, something extraordinary is underway. Spontaneously, impulsively, house by house, hour by hour, a street revolution is sweeping the country. At first, I'm so immersed in my clinical work, this groundswell of caring almost passes me by. One evening I pull into my village and blink in astonishment. Rainbows have sprung up in all the neighbors' gardens, gorgeous in their gaudiness and wonky messages of thanks. Children paint, we love our key workers, and their lockdown parents pin their artwork to lampposts on the high street. Little collectives of neighbors coordinate themselves on WhatsApp, collecting food and medicine for anyone in need, all now cocooned within their neighbor's arms, interlocked and steady to ensure that no one falls. When I asked my sister if I could borrow her rubber Crocs to wear inside the hospital, she immediately messages her street's COVID group and five pairs are delivered to her doorstep in under an hour, each now destined for staff in A&E. I'm so sorry, that's actually making me almost cry remembering that because it was amazing. Sorry. Not once in my lifetime have I seen anything like this grassroots eruption of improvised altruism. Communities coming together, the young and healthy offering to shop for those shielding, restaurants delivering mountains of takeaways to overworked hospital staff everywhere, sorry, everywhere the desire to be useful to do something, to make it better, to help out. It startles and thrills me. There is, it turns out, such a thing as society. We do have more in common than that which divides us. Despite the country's scars, so deep rooted over Brexit, when the situation demands it, when what we face is life or death, most people act bravely and selflessly and with boundless initiative to protect ourselves and our neighbors from harm. And just for a moment, it really doesn't matter how we vote or what we do for a living. We're facing this adversity by and large as one. 
and there is a paradox with social distancing, so unexpected, so hopeful, it makes me want to laugh out loud. We have never been closer while standing further apart. Um, Thank you. Natasha, Rachel, you're a gift. You're not only as doctors are you a gift, obviously, to your profession, but you're a gift to a festival of literature. You, the fact that you're working doctors and you're so rich in ideas about what you do is just something that many of us don't quite realize. And, and the masks you wear, that you're having to wear now, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And we could easily have another hour, and we've only had 42 minutes, um, because you've touched on something. It even makes me feel as a festival organizer, they've helped me get it right. Yesterday's author was How to Be Animal, a new history of what it means to be human. And, and 12 minutes ago, you both said, we mustn't forget that we're creatures. And you talked about touch. And I'm one of those people who is inclined to faint or have panic attacks when needles come, not the pain, just the needle. And when I had my COVID jab, being put upside down and so on, wasn't quite the solution. Two doctors, one male, one female, touched me and everything was all right. Um, it's so good to hear this from you. So wonderful to hear it. Um, Natasha, uh, you could be an interviewer as well. Um, you're wasted at the hospital. Um, um, and, and Rachel, you're clearly a writer. Um, now I've talked a bit and you have as well, but, and, and you've read a bit, but I want to read one of the passages um, that I marked in your prologue um, just before we finish. Natasha, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I, I've got carried away. Um, where is that passage? I tell you what, Natasha, say something interesting while I find this passage. I'm determined to find it. Of course. I tell you what, <laughs> I, I'm I, tell you what Natasha, it, I was looking in the wrong book. I was looking in How to Be Animal. I, I, this was the book I was meant to be looking in. Um, well, I, Im I imagine they complement each other well. They do, especially on the point that both of you made. Um, Rachel says this, but what dominates palliative medicine is not the proximity to death, but the best bits of living. Kindness, courage, love, tenderness. These are the qualities that so often saturate a person's last days. It can be chaotic, messy, almost violent with grief, but daily, I am surrounded at work by human beings at their most remarkable, at their best, unable to retreat from the fact and the ache of our impermanence, yet getting on with living, getting on with loving all the same. Um, we, we are so optimistic. It's such a good reminder to us. It's unbelievable in these tricky times. I can't get over it. Um, I've said it once, you're a gift. Um, do you want to have any last word before we stop? Either of you. I, I suppose I would like to say um, to, to, to anyone watching, it's been an unimaginable year, hasn't it? It's so traumatic in, in, in so many conceivable ways. But I just want people to know that inside the hospitals, even for all the patients who have died from COVID, hospitals are filled with people trying their hardest to overcome all of the barriers that, that, that COVID has, has put in our way, trying so hard to be humane and reach out to our patients whether it's just talking or listening or holding a hand, even though we're wearing gloves. We've all understood how important that is like never before. And no one, we, we try our absolute hardest to make sure nobody dies alone. We always try and make sure someone is there. Um, people may be frightened, they may be suffering, but NHS staff are there for them. And honestly, 
every single person I work with goes the extra mile to try and ensure that. And I just would really love people to know that. Uh, Dr. Natasha Wiggins, um, Dr. Rachel Clark, thank you for sharing those thoughts with us today. Thank you for smiling so often. Thank you for being so optimistic. Um, the Swindon Festival of Literature, the people of Swindon, I think a lot more people. Um, we thank you all. Um, thank you very much. Until we meet again, keep well. Thank you.